Hi, my name is Matt Perez. I'm here with Jose Leal, uh, my partner, and uh, Andrew Tilling, uh, who happens to live in Italy. And um, we're going to go through our usual conversation with Andrew, and, and really looking forward to, uh, to talk about the, the um, you know, the, the, the changes that are coming and this is being part of. So, Andrew, uh, welcome to the show, and um, tell us a little bit about your business and what are you doing in your business and uh, what are your clients doing? Matt, Jose, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be with you guys. Um, I think it's, the big question of what we're doing is, in fact, something that a lot of you know people have known me for a long time are still trying to figure out. And you know, I, I talk with a whole bunch of people in marketing trying to articulate it better as well. But you know, for us right now, what we focus on at the Hive Change Consultancy is around transforming working cultures to deliver results that matter. So how does that pan out and what matters? Um, well, that often depends on the people that we're working with and you know, understanding a little bit about their story and what it is that they're trying to do. But essentially for me, it's about trying to create um, a workplace where it doesn't matter what role you have, doesn't matter in fact what industry you're in, um, what business you're in, what role, everything that you do is, is somehow making a positive impact for future generations. I think it's really important to to frame it in that way. It's good to make a positive impact. That's great. But if we are discounting future impacts in the decisions that we make, so for instance, it's like, yeah, great, we can make transfer all this energy over here and build this wonderful infrastructure, and that's going to help all these people in these ways. But then we're we're taking away from you know future comfort of future generations of indeed the planet. Then you know that's a big future cost that we're discounting. So you know, if trying to factor in that that very long-term view into day-to-day decision-making um, can in fact be quite challenging, particularly when you're under pressure to uh, deliver on quarterly results or you know, hit that number. So you know, often we, when we go in and work with a client and we're trying to create these positive uh, performance and, and, and indeed increase profit, and a lot of our work you know, with sales teams really does help in those kinds of ways. But it's this big question of round, why are we here? Mm -hmm. And why does what we do matter? And and if we can kind of get our head into that, it becomes so much easier to get that kind of decision making where people instinctively know what a good choice is. What and we're talking right down on the front line. Um, and it seems it seems kind of sensible. It seems kind of it, it seems to make sense. I mean, a lot of um, military organizations are all about kind of decentralizing that decision making and trying to bring it to the front line. And I know that you guys are are all over this idea of of kind of um, you know that co decision making across the organization. But trying to align people's thinking and and in such a way where they're still able to contribute diverse opinions. Um, creates all kinds of cultural tensions which really struggle to play out when you've got a strong leadership structure or um, expectations about how things have always been done. So for me, it, you know, I, uh, me and my team, when we go on in, we, we spend an awful lot of time really trying to understand an organization, try to understand the challenges, try to understand where the real value they can deliver to the, the wider stakeholder environment is and, and how they can do that better in, in a way that also happens to be quite profitable too. So, you know, that's that's the fun game that we play. Yeah, actually, the the way that we run companies today, in my view, is business hustle. It, it's, it goes contrary to making money and, and and growing things and stuff like that. So, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. The the name the hive. Where does where does that come from? Well, really, kind of working together better. I mean, we, we've got this kind of um, sign-off, if you like, around collective intelligence. It's like that really everything we do kind of boils down to that. And, and a lot of people kind of think, well, hang on, isn't that group think? You know, that's really dangerous. Well, yes, but what about group mind? And if you can bring in diversity of thinking and a freedom to challenge people's thinking, if you actually look at a beehive and you try to figure out, for instance, if they're going to swarm somewhere else, they, mm-hmm. they do this wonderful behavior of kind of butting heads. It's like they've flown around. They think there's a good place to go and do a, a, a new hive over there or a new nest. And what they'll do is they'll come together and start butting heads in different directions until they kind of convince each other that actually, all right, then we, we, 
by we've reached a consensus we're going to go in that direction and they'll take the new queen and woof they're off you know but it's it's a decision making process it's not yes, of, of individuals you know it's, so we we love that idea of, about bringing in diversity and challenging each other's thinking and and bringing that into what we do but for me the biggest problem that i found when i worked into when i started working in the corporate world and i didn't always do that i i grew up in a um very kind of uh, social enterprise environment where we were my parents were running projects for benefiting the community my mother's was all around theater so i got very much involved with performing arts and i ended up being a professional actor running a, a youth theater for the first kind of seven years of my professional life and it works on all these different projects and did lots of work with with kids who are at risk of falling into crime and all this kind of stuff and you know loved all that work had a bit of a crisis of uh I had no belief in the in the industry. I just didn't resonate with me. I wanted to do something different. So I traveled for a bit, have a had a good look at the world, and kind of came back and had my first my first professional job was working with fundraisers, fundraising for all kinds of different organizations like Friends of the Earth and uh, Greenpeace and um, Amnesty International and all these these um, incredible organizations learned a lot about their stories and about human rights and you know the challenges that we're facing as a world but with all these amazing people super smart very passionate couldn't seem to get anything done yes. right i mean in this, in this theater environment it was it was like look you're under high pressure there's no budget um you've got these talents of varying skills, you know, and we've still got a job to do and we need to get it done by this deadline and we find a way to do it. Feast or famine, we find a way. But something within this professional structured environment, all these people that I assumed were super smart, super intelligent, knew all these wonderful things and the ways to operate that were a bit alien to me, I just felt that the more I stayed there, the less effective I got. You know? <laughs> and it was like this is something's wrong here you know so I, I really did kind of bake my noodle on it and i did manage to lead a bit of a culture change with some you know extraordinary people working in this organization and we we doubled results we raised 27 million pounds um almost 35 i guess dollars in that um in that one year worth of donations that were long-term donations and I thought, I, I kind of came away from that and I thought, right, there's a consultancy here. There's something about collaboration. There's something about working together and thinking together better. And um, together with my wife, we, we founded the, uh, this organization that to primarily help with social enterprise. And then you know, we, we started looking at, at corporates. But because of a, um, a, a documentary called The Corporation, which I, I don't know if you guys, yeah, this award-winning documentary, very, very powerful. Um, but the idea that it put forward was that the, if you look at the characteristics of um, psychopathy, all right, so things like um, glib and superficial charm, lack of remorse or guilt, um, a lack of realistic goals, um, uh, all kinds of different things, and, and also a callous lack of empathy, if you map these behavior traits against um, the legal entity that is known as a corporation, mm. actually, you can see in many cases instances of this psychopathic behavior, which kind of suggests that it's systemic, right? Mm -hmm. And this had a really profound effect on me. And in fact, the guy who created the, the structure, um, so Robert Hare, I mean, he came out and he said, well, look, hang on. That's kind of not what I was saying. That's not where I was going. And in fact, it's not that everybody who's a corporation is a psychopath, but in fact, you can see these elements and maybe some do could display that as a bit of a, an exercise. And so, okay, so it's been kind of tempered back. But then recently you look at it and it's like, you know, suddenly you've got, you know, uh, it, the percentage is, I've got it here, between 4 and 12% of CEOs exhibit psychopathic traits. And it's like, okay, so hang on, is it the, is it the institution that we're going into? Is it, is it the role of just being in power? that's kind of making us behave this way? Or is it that people with these traits get into these positions of power? But, but what is it that's, that's meaning that we're having this blatant disregard for the truth 
in recognizing our responsibilities of our impact or, um, or recognizing the, the real challenges that we face with regards to, to climate, something I'm very passionate about, or indeed um, rights of the workers and all those different aspects. Why do we, why do we ignore them in the pursuit of this, this idea of profit when really these are very real needs, they're very real issues, and they're by, by, by definition of market, means there's profit and opportunity there if we, yes. if we embrace them and lean in, into them, right? Yes. So, so for me, I kind of thought, right, we, we've got to f figure out a way of, you know, how do you treat someone with psychopathic traits? And, you know, the, for me, that was all around empathy. And so I kind of made it a personal mission to bring in empathy into organizations. How do you bake it in? How do you, how do you bring not shareholder choices but stakeholder needs into the heart of decision making how do you, how do you which, which can include shareholders right but but that broader um stakeholder environment and and you know be that whether it's decentralizing ownership which i know is something that you guys are very passionate about um to shared ownership models to the patagonia model of hey let's give it to the earth you know wh whatever those choices may be if we can look at it as how are we make a positive impact within the people who are affected by what we do and, and use empathy as the mother of innovation. So if necessity is the mother of invention, then mm. an empathy for other people's needs can inspire great innovation that can scale and grow, mm -hmm. and deliver outstanding uh, results. So that's, that's kind of um, what's been baking my noodle for the last two decades. <laughs> you, you, you talk about empathy. Um... Do you see empathy as, as something that is um, innate to us or, or do you see it's something we need to teach people? What, what's, what's your view mm -hmm. on what is empathy? Because that, that I think alters the way we approach that, that, uh, that line of thinking, right? For sure. So I, um, I didn't know this about me, but it's, it's taken me a while to understand, but I, um, I exhibit um, traits of, of high sensitivity. So I'm, I'm wired biologically, there's not, nothing I can do about it, to feel um, or experience other people's states or changes in state. That, that just gives me this, this kind of a, a bit of an awareness of the room, which kind of helped me read the room when I was teaching, helps me read the room when, I'm, when, I'm, when I was performing, helps me read the room when I'm, when I'm facilitating and, and training now. And being um, interviewed. <laughs> well, <laughs> it depends. I mean, you know, I might completely miss this one. I don't know, but um, it makes me kind of feel, um, makes me feel, and, and it took me a while to figure out what was my feeling and what was other people's for a while. It kind of left me pretty confused, to be honest, in, in the high stress scenarios. Um, but over the years, I kind of learned to realize that okay, there's there's differing states in the room. There's people are responding to different situations differently or to the same situation differently. And I'm, by, by understanding that and factoring that in, I can make better decisions as a leader. Mm -hmm. So in an environment where we are agreeing to work together and um, yeah, and, and collaborate towards working towards a goal, if I can just build in a communication point that says, do you know what? I don't feel comfortable with what it is that you've just said, or that brings up some fear in me, or do you know what? I'm worried about that, or I'm really excited about that, and this sounds like the best idea ever. But if we can voice those things without fear of um, repercussions, because I think fear and blame is a, is a big kind of part of the problem, right? Yeah. Um, then we can really start um, getting information, better information about how our different choices are going to impact people. And what that helps us to do is identify a bit about what's important to people. And we can name that and we, we've got good words for that around values, you know, in our culture by identifying different values and conflicting values at different stakeholders within our environment. And by factoring those into our decision making, we can start allowing ourselves to be influenced by more than the guiding tenets of our organization or indeed our role. And, you know, when I came on to speak with you guys, it was, it was around this idea of, you know, our, our, our leader, as, as leaders, you know, should we be letting go of control, right? Because it's a, it's, it's a terrifying thing, 
to let go and to suddenly have people that we, in some cases, we're not even connected with. You know, we've, we've got people in between us and them and they're out on the, on the front line and they are, um, you know, I mean, interacting with our customers. And, and, you know, if I haven't got control over them as a leader, then surely I'm somehow putting myself at risk or a failure. And, I've, and I saw it really play out during the pandemic when um, some clients that we work with um, out of sheer necessity or need or concern adopted the command and control structure from something that had been quite loose before. And it was often cases very effective for the first wave because everybody recognized there was this big chat and everyone's kind of suspended their need to be autonomous just to contribute in a different way but in the in the spirit of the cause suspended but disbelief exactly that right <laughs> and then we move into this idea of all right then well second wave well come on guys we're going to keep on controlling because we've got to do it you know and then you get this kind of like oh, all right and then third wave it's like do you know what i'm done i'm absolutely done so and, and I, for, from my experience, what that's seen is that we, we suddenly got this big pushback that said, if this carries on, if you keep this culture in place, I'm out and I'm looking for somewhere where I can be more fulfilled, where I can be contributing and own that contribution. And I think as, a, as we move, as, as um, we have different, uh, a different way of kind of thinking and working, collaborating as new generations come through who are very aware of the wider impacts of, of, of business in the world and they've been brought up knowing that sustainability is a very real concern, um, that people's, uh, people have got the right to be themselves, you know, and, and to live their lives as, as they, they so choose, you know, with their values and their choices. You know, as we start recognizing these things and we start bringing them into an organization, people aren't just going to accept a cultural reality or accept... <laughs> Andrew, I want to take it. I want to take it back uh, because you were describing the current situation, and, and um, you said if we can only only get these people to lose control and to be more empathic and stuff like that, but the system, the overall system that they live in, and the reason they made it to CEO or whatever it is, is based on competition. The system is based. And, and that, what do you call it, psychopathic behavior? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because who wins when uh, all the brutes get on the field? It's the guy who's the big, bigger brute, right? The guy with the biggest stick kills everybody else and he ends up on top. Um, so, so, in a sense, by making them, having them be empathic and stuff like that, things may work better below that position but things with things with the board will not work as well because <laughs> the, the the answers when they say how come we're not making this or we're not doing that or we're not making the margin or whatever it is the answer is not going to make sense to them if it comes from empathy and it comes from you know making making people feel good making people feel more playful which is part of innovation um so, and that's one of the big challenges in making the transition, right? People who want, people who want to make the change, but they can't because they live in a system where they, they can't afford to make the change. What, what, do you, what do you say to that? About three different things, so bear with me while I try to unpack them. <laughs> Number one, I mean, culturally, I think that empathy is extraordinarily powerful in a sales environment. You build that yes. into the culture of your organization. If you understand and can understand at a very deep level the challenges of your customer, then you are able to provide, or not even just provide the new solutions or innovate, but tailor the way that you communicate the value that you are selling to that customer. And, I agree. And so, that they can, so it resonates with them and, that, and they are more likely to adopt it and apply those, those solutions and they get so much more benefit and value out of it as a result. So, and, and they um, become more, more loyal customers, to use the right word, uh, in the sense that, you know, they know they, they're understood by you. And, and so in the sales environment, it makes perfect sense. Try to explain right. that to a traditional sales people, people. And it doesn't play. It doesn't go very far. 
not without a sales culture transformation program, which has been something yes. we've been building out with, yeah. with Drive, because it really because people don't get it. They 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 want the short term win because they've been conditioned to get the short term wins. Right. And you know, trying to break that down and kind of look more long tail, it doesn't mean that you can't build in short term wins, but it's about trying to understand how they're part of a bigger program, trying to trying to build those deeper connections. And to be honest, salespeople who go with that focus of just get the short term win are, are effectively order taking. It's about connecting people with something that they want and then finalizing the deal, which will be automated if it's not already within the next two to right. three years. Right. Unless you unless you are making that human connection, really you're doing yourself out of a job. But I, I do think that there's great profitability in bringing empathy and understanding to your stakeholder environment and, and building stronger and more effective joint ventures and partnerships as a result. So so I think there's a lot of profit there. So that's that's kind of number one. Number two, you mentioned playfulness. So I have um I, I do a martial art called capoeira, but I say do, what we say is we, we play this game called capoeira. And I, I've right. studied capoeira for the uh, best part of 17 years now with the London School of Capoeira, um, Mr. Silvia Bazzarelli and Marcus de Santos, and two very inspiring people. And what I found with capoeira is the objective of capoeira is not to win. You go into the hodder where the game takes place and you play and you have an exchange with your with your partner. It's often non-contact, but you do make it very clear that you could make contact or indeed, if well, it's non-contact if you don't get out of the way, basically. But <laughs> if you, um, when you play that game, you've got masters who have played for decades playing with people who have played for months. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow there is this exchange. And what's really special is that both learn. Because the objective of the game is to have a good game. Yes. Now, I've used that to help train negotiation for years. You know, that not go in there with a win-lose attitude, that I've got to beat you to get the best out of this negotiation. We've got to find a win-win solution that mm -hmm. works for everybody. And that requires communication. And that requires, hey, empathy and openness and vulnerability and all those very human things, which I agree can disappear the minute you go into uh, an organization or a system, right. which is then all about competition. But but not every, I, I think some, you know, sometimes we forget and, and bear in mind that I, I work with many very, uh, very many inspiring um, uh, people from the states uh, who, you know, exhibit all kinds of, of very progressive and very grounded and very sensible thinking in what they do. But you know, the the classic United States model of sports is that win lose, and you bring mm -hmm. that also into business. I, I captain in my team, therefore I will promote you in this organization because clearly you are a good leader. Well, not always, right? Right. There's, there's other forms of games and there's other forms of play and there's other forms of creativity and there's other forms of exploration and um, experimentation. Which, uh, but there's only one that. form of organizing that's, that's systemic right now. Right. And that, what we call fiat, is mm. a system of not only do we compete my organization against your organization, my market share against your market share or everybody else's market share. But we as individuals against each other, our departments against each other's departments and my role against your role. And I mean, we climb the corporate ladder. It's literally by pulling someone else's feet out from underneath them to get up the corporate ladder. It, there is no other way to climb the corporate ladder unless right. you're either pulling somebody off the ladder or you're climbing over their back. Uh, so it, that that system is what we're talking about. Is is that? I know we're kind of being a little direct here. But does that feel right to you? Well, it's Margaret Hefferman's Super Chicken's TED Talk, isn't it? That you know, you you if you go through with this Super Chicken model, which is um, recruiting to your team only the the highly driven overachievers, then it ends up being counterproductive because. Um, there's a there's a hyper competitive in the group dynamic as you as you've expressed and I think that um, looking at systems where you know when one wins more yeah you know, everybody wins it's it's that team team dynamic I mean for me compensation plans for instance in the sales team um, are often all about 
how many leads you can steal off your friends. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. That's, that, that can't be the way forward. Whereas if you look at it, that there are shared team goals that we can participate in, I think that helps, which is why I think co-ownership is so very attractive because you can you know, give everybody responsibility for that, for that win. But I think it goes beyond- Not give, not give. That's part of our mentality is we say, we give this thing to someone. Ah, we suggest I own it in the first place, right? Right. Oh, we, which, I, which I love. And I think it, it kind of plays into this idea of um, you know, the impact that I want to you know, create and help in the world. I know that I can't deliver that impact on my own. No. You know, it would be narcissistic to suggest that, that it would, and a serious case of white savior syndrome, right? So how do, we, how do we deal with that? And, you know, for me, that means that I have to empower other people to go yes. and, and deliver have to empower and, each other. And that's the trick. We need to empower each other, right? You because see, you empowering others will only work if they can empower you. Where the exchange comes in. Exactly. Which is where I learn from playing a junior member of the of the Capoeira team, as well as I learn from playing a master, yes. you know, there yeah. is an exchange yeah. that takes place. That's it. Yeah, yeah. That's it. it's a beautiful dynamic. I, I read, uh, I think this morning, that um, they put uh, caps on people to track their their brain activity, and um, there were students and teachers, and the teacher would have a short lecture, and um, People learned the most, people learned when their brains were in sync. And people that whose brain was more, more in sync with, with uh, instructor learned the most. And, and they then passed it on. And um, w which is very close to, to the idea of adjacent, adjacent learning, which is uh, a concept of education, which is you learn more from a guy that's a little bit ahead of you than from a guy who's miles away from you <laughs> because it's easier to get in sync with that person. Um, and uh, and uh, Caporea and all the rest of the, most of the martial arts are that way where, where you're learning from each other. Mm -hmm. And um, in, the, in the case of, of karate, it, when my kids were little, they obviously couldn't compete with the big guy, right? But they did. Hmm. And and what the big guy would, would do, and you could see it because it was so obvious, it, it was the, they found their weaknesses hmm. and didn't exploit the weaknesses. They exploited their strength. And uh, I thought that was beautiful. So uh, when you start talking about martial arts, I thought, yep, that's beautiful. And um, But it's this idea that, that we're all... We're all helping each other to go forward to move and 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 going back to the fear hierarchy the top. and by the way fiat means because i said so hmm. so it's like fiat currency right it's like right, it, right. it's so it is kind yeah of it's, it. it's a dollar because they say so hmm. nixon said uh, it's a dollar it's a dollar and um there's no gold backing or anything like that which was a hmm. stupid thing to begin with but anyways um so the fiat hierarchy Kind of gets in the way of that, and I applaud your your effort to try to make transformation from the point of view of getting smaller wins in sales and this and that, and then bring it all up to uh, to a CEO who who can then find a way to communicate with the board. That's very important. The board the board represents the owners, mm -hmm. and they they're the ultimate bosses, mm -hmm. and so. That's got to be part of the formula is, is how to how to make the transition. But in the end, we don't see any lasting solution with the with the fiat hierarchy still in place. As long as you have a fiat hierarchy, I can always say I'm the new CEO, and everything that went be before me was total bullshit, and we're gonna do with all that. We're gonna do things by the book. And uh, and so that's the problem with with um, fiat hierarchy and and the owners behind it. Well, it's a permissive structure. It's a permissive structure, right? You allow everyone else allows the individual who gets fiated into place, 
uh, to to be the one that has the answers, to be the one that mm-hmm. makes the decisions. And we just wait, sit back, wait for that person to make their decisions. And um, and that's the system we live in. And so f- the qu- my question to you, Andrew, is how do you deal with that as you're progressing within the organization, you're working with sales and obviously you've got, you know, the sales director or or VP or something of that nature um, working within their environment, but then having a different type of relationship with the, you know, the C-suite and Mm -hmm. them having a different relationship with the investors or the board. Uh, What, where, where do you see that line? How do you deal with that? Well, I think what we're talking to is is essentially values conflicts. It's like the, you know what are the priorities of different people within the organisation, which you know come about whether you are an acting troop that is trying to you know figure out how they're going to get through the week uh, on a tight budget to you know um, dealing with the value conflicts of, of a board and you know the people who are delivering the services to the customers. Okay. And yeah. so I think there's a you know identifying what those values are. And mapping out those conflicts, I think, is a really important part of what we do. And we have a, a process that we use called the STORM process, which begins with understanding your stakeholder environment. It's what's your current situation from the perspective of all the different stakeholders involved. And, and trying to understand um, where, what happens if nothing changes with regards to the issue you're looking to address. So understanding what their trajectory is, what their, um, their resources are, intel, value, empathy that we're bringing to the table in order to address this particular challenge. And once we've got a sense of that situation, then we're going to start shaping a target which actually aligns with the, the values and what's important to the various different stakeholders that we have, that we've as a group collectively moved to the center of our focus. So it becomes less about the, well, the shareholders say this, so it's that, right? And it becomes more about, well, these are the people who are central to that issue. And, and these are the values which are important to them. Therefore, that, that must inform what we see a solution to look like. And that's, that's super powerful. So, and, you know, I, I've spotted a, a question that's come up with people asking what's the, the, the top three things to bring a project to fruition in the most effective way. A really clear sense of where you are and where you want to be from a stakeholder's perspective, from a diverse stakeholder's perspective, I think is absolutely crucial. We've got to define the gap in a healthy, broader view. Um, so that's that's definitely number one. So do you bring the the investors or the owners or whatever uh, the board basically into the conversation as well? Or in some cases, yeah. In fact, I, we had a, a really interesting moment where I was working with an organization that were looking to rebuild their vision and um, mission for a, a, a reinvention of, of of the organization due to various different challenges they've experienced. And I remember a um, uh, a VC was in the mix who had some investment in the organization. And we were talking about the team and the various different challenges. And, and the argument was kind of like, look, they were making was, was look, just, just forget trying to do anything inspiring, you know, just copy what your competitors are doing and take their website headings and recognize those are your priorities and just impose that on a new market. And away you go, you know, keep it simple. And we were talking about the team and what they were invested in and what they wanted to do. And, you know, I just saw him write these notes just basically saying F team. It's just irrelevant, you know. And I was just like, wow, you know. But you know what? When that guy left, (laughs) having voiced his thoughts, it's amazing how complete polar opposite direction everybody went for. Everybody went. Because it was actually, do you know what? If if that's, that's, we're going to create something so damn compelling that you can't say no to it because this is what we want to do because if the alternative is so uninspiring and flat, there's no purpose there. It's just money. But if we want to invest uh, all this, t- t- this, this resource and talent, then let's do something really worthwhile. And it's, it's incredible what they're doing, but that shared sense of purpose, that real communicable sense of why is the second thing that I would say needs to be in there. So yes, sometimes we do include people with those, you know, um, who, who are shareholders and they do have a, a, a clear perspective, but it's really also powerful to see their mind shift once they get closer to the people who are involved in that day-to-day and what you can learn from those 
well, I, I think the mirror neurons that are perhaps firing some of that connection that you were talking about, Matt, with regards to, you know, learning from someone who's kind of just a step ahead rather than someone who's way ahead. If you've got more connections, there, more transfers. So bringing people into a space where transference can take place is a really big part of the discussion, which is sitting in circle, which is something we've done since we came out of the caves, right? It's um, we know well, how we it used works. to do it in the caves. And in the caves, <laughs> indeed. It was perhaps more cozy then as well, you know. I, um, I know we're running out of time, Andrew, and, and um, ah. but, but I, I, I want to I ask a question because you said it earlier, aligned values. And uh, for some time now, I've been wondering if that's really the answer to, to bringing people together. And... Something occurred to me today, as you said, aligned values. Uh, I wonder if this resonates for you. Is it aligned values as much as it is aligned perception? Is it that we are bringing to ourselves this approach of what do we see together that then brings about this resonance of where we are. And, and we talk more about what we see. We see the impact. We see the people for what they are. We see the empathy with which we are connecting with people. And that, that aligned awareness is really where we might then say, oh, we have an aligned uh, set of values or an aligned set of principles or whatever that might be. Does that resonate for you? I've never had this thought, but it really, it was your words that spurred that in, in my mind today. So a couple of things on that. Yes, it really does. Um, for me, the the, uh, the target setting, if you like, of where it is that we want to go, we, we use four Ps, which is the, the first of all, purpose, why we're here. Um, the second is the parameters. So in other words, those values that uh, inform the parameters through, that we are going to be creative within. And it's, so therefore, those values also sometimes in conflict because that creates beautiful creative tension, right? Um, then inform that perception, which is the third P. So I love that you use those words, right? Um, and that perception, it goes deeper than just vision. It's what we see, hear, feel got a sense of how we what we articulating in our own mind you know when you know as we bring this vision about and then once we've kind of gone deep there and everybody's contributing to that what we then do is we create a pinpoint moment something where we which proves to us that everything that we're trying to achieve has taken place now we then articulate that pin that really get that kind of sense of where we are and where we want to be but here's the crucial thing for leaders we then let go of the how it's about asking people who have now bought into that journey. That's the story. Let's celebrate the, every evidence that we can find that suggests that you're capable of doing it, that, that, that it's happening, that change is happening, that positive impact is taking place, that we're moving along, that, that our situation has moved. Always about doing everything you can to lend whatever influence you have, because it is by doing that, that you see all that influence and impact and 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 profit, be that through financial or indeed sense of accomplishment, land in that team that you are working with. And it's that shared experience that you've played your role in, that they have delivered with you. And that that shared experience for me is is the true definition of what a company mm -hmm. is. Yeah, I, I love uh, when Matt and I were writing the book, the book, oh, I got it on the wrong side, the book. The book. Um, um, we, one of the things that we, uh, you, you talk about different values and, and, and conflict. One of the things that we conflicted on was our, our view of, of using the word company or not, or companies. Mm -hmm. um, and Matt uh, pointed out that, he loves companies because it means it comes from breaking bread together. Right. Compound. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and so we've lost that. Right. But coming back around to that, where we are breaking bread together and not, uh, I'm an employee 
of this fiat system that I need to uh, obey in order to be able to, to have my bread. It's a very different way of thinking about what a company is, right? Breaking bread together means that we share the bread, not that the bread that I take home is based on whether I'm permitted to or not. And that's, I think, the work that you're doing is making that difference, right? Yes. Yeah. I certainly hope so. And, or rather, I certainly hope that somehow I can contribute to helping the leaders and the facilitators and my team do that. It's their impact. It's their vision. You know, I've, I've in many ways kind of said, hey, look, this is how I think we can work together. What can we do with that? And that vision and that goal that I articulated earlier on, that's, that's come from my team, you know, my team. Yes, and yes, come my. from the team. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, you know, we've baked in things into the legal structure, like, you know, we, we, um, the decisions that we make are made for the benefit of the stakeholders involved in the impact so that that's in there. That gives me a little bit more of a sense of reassurance that, that how we start this little organization and as we grow it out, it, it's going to be able to keep some of those principles in mind. But I, I you know, I, I want to really credit you guys because, I mean, there's, I, I remember reading the 15 Commitments of, of Conscious Leadership, which was the most difficult and yet easy to understand book I've ever read. You know, it's like difficult because it really challenged me. But I, I really had a similar reaction in reading your work and having a sense of the very simple observation that you've made, but the profound impacts it makes in terms of, of helping us rethink and, and to step away from what is, is very clear when you can see it, a system which, which really doesn't work. And yes. to, to think bigger and bolder and more collaboratively and more open and, and have a clearer sense of the... Um, and, and consciousness of the the impacts that we make as as individuals in this world, um, mm. and, and particularly when we work so collectively with such tremendous potential for impact as a company can create, having yeah. a sense of those responsibilities and rethinking and doing so in a more responsible way is something which I think is long overdue. So my compliments to you both. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much for that. So um, next week's guest is Edgar. Horse, founder of uh, GOTT, Gathering of the Tribe, the Conscious Fellowship. Uh, don't know much about it, so we hope to learn more from Edgar and, uh, and looking forward to that. And um, this has been terrific. I, I'm, I'm really, because what you're doing, by the way, trying to transform corporations, not small companies starting from scratch kind of thing, but big corporation is a bigger challenge that I was, that I've been willing to take on. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we have a lot to learn from you. And um, your background, I think, is, is perfect for, for that kind of endeavor. Um, you're, you're, the theater and the social uh, thinking and stuff like that, I think it all came together in the right place at the right time. So um, looking forward to staying, to staying in touch. Yeah, and learning more. And learning more, yeah. And likewise, I from you both, thank you so much, for really, for the, your insights and for, and for inviting me onto this forum. It's been really interesting to, to really raise my thinking to, to somehow contribute to, to your own. So I, I deeply appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you.